Thanks so much, Laura. On behalf of the Market Links production team today, um, I'd like to introduce our moderators for today's session, Autumn Gorman and Lawrence Camp from the Private Sector Engagement Hub in USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation. Autumn and Lawrence, over to you. Sorry, thank you very much uh, on mute. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, uh, and very glad to be here and glad that you all are here today for this, uh, for this webinar. I think it's really gonna be a very exciting webinar. So uh, glad to, to be here. The nexus between economic development uh, finance is clear. Economic growth, as well as other development objectives such as better health uh, and efficient modern agriculture require investment. Investment in higher education, investment in new technology, investment in modern agricultural processing equipment, et cetera. And this investment almost always requires financing. Uh, the good news, there is abundant capital available for financing, both commercial, finance, commercial capital seeking a full financial return, uh, as well as what we will call development finance, which is looking for an economic and social return and willing to, have a, to, to achieve a somewhat lower financial return. The bad news is that it's difficult to channel that capital to the sorts of investments which will advance our development goals. Why? Because the higher risks and the transaction costs in our partner countries raise the required returns on capital, often to the point that transactions which would advance our development goals often don't qualify for commercial finance. And in theory, this is where development finance comes in. Why? <clears throat> because development finance is, or at least should be, less focused on a commercial return and more on development returns. Development agencies and development finance providers have aligned objectives. Both want to accomplish development outcomes, poverty reduction, job creation, clean water, et cetera but too often their actions are not aligned, or as should I say, as, as, as aligned as they might be, which is one reason for the formation of Development Finance Corporation to better align development finance activities with development goals. So British uh, Investment International, Gatsby Africa, who commissioned an analysis to look at the challenges and opportunities for better aligning these two worlds. We will hear Ajun Bhopal from Gatsby Africa, who will introduce the study, and then turn to Justin Van Rin and Irene Hu, who authored the study. Ajun is head of partnerships at Gatsby Africa, which is a private foundation supporting sector transformation in East Africa. Over the past three years, Ajun has provided strategy backstopping to Gatsby's programs in livestock, agricultural inputs, and water. He has also led Gatsby's conversation with FSD Africa um, and British International Investment, formerly CDC, to explore how sector transformation program can align with development uh, finance in a more strategic way. Prior to, uh, prior to joining Gatsby Africa, Arjun has worked in sustainability and private sector development through roles with PWC, Save the Children, and UNICEF. Irene has 10 plus years of experience in management consulting and financial advisory focusing on emerging markets. He was previously an associate partner at Open Capital Advisors and is based in uh, market in Kenya uh, for the last six plus years, working with businesses, investors, and development partners on growth and investment facilitation across 10 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. She has led multi-year USAID initiatives, PACE, IRP, TRAIN, train, combining TA with impact investors to facilitate over $30 million in investment in East Africa. And Justin is an inclusive growth consultant with 10, 12 years, sorry, experience in designing and delivering technical assistance projects with clients such as FCDO slash DFID, CDC uh, Group, ILO, World Bank, and CETA. Recent engagements have focused on systems change, investment linked TA, and youth, uh, youth uh, employment. This is really an interesting topic that we're about to cover today. There's certainly ways in which development agencies can support development finance activities, and we do a fair amount. 
at the systemic level, trying to reduce the barriers which constrain investment, uh, ins such as ensuring enforceability of contract, reducing um, corruption, building the financial sector infrastructure, et cetera. And we work at the transactional level as well, providing, for example, business advisor services support to tee up transactions important to development objectives and providing blended finance in order to attract uh, impact finance, and commercial finance. But can we and should we uh, be more intentional about lining with DFC and other development finance providers such as impact investors, philanthropic organizations, uh, and uh, development finance institutions? And if so, how should we go about this? Following the presentation of the study, we'll hear from uh, um, DFC on how it is aligning a development agenda with a finance agenda, and then open up to questions. And with that, let me turn it over to Arjun. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence, and um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and thank you, USAID and Market Links, for setting up what promises to be a really exciting webinar. Uh, Lawrence, you've introduced the agenda really well, so I won't go over it. But in short, uh, Gatsby Africa and uh, British International Investments saw this huge potential for even greater development impact if private sector development and development finance could collaborate better. At Gatsby, we've seen that, uh, uh, like many donor programs, we offer firm and value, cha value chain level technical assistance, capacity building and grants, and look to strengthen the enabling environment. But to really grow um, these uh, industries and, and introduce innovations requires significant concessional and growth capital, which typically donor programs don't have. And this is where uh, the advantage of, of partnering or collaborating with impact investors and development finance can really unlock potential. So in short, we see uh, this huge opportunity for uh, even greater transformational impact if development finance and donor programs can align their strategies and incentives around specific industries and geographies. And that was really the, the reason we commissioned this study. And the study looked at what's already happening in practice, but also looked to recommend how these two sides could collaborate more effectively and efficiently going forward. And we're very lucky today to have um, uh, Justin and Irene who led the study for us, uh, who will take us through the findings. But I'll pass over first to Alex from BII, who will share uh, their perspective and why they commissioned the study. Over to you, Alex. Hi, everyone. It's really nice to be here. Um, so my name is Alex Kaczarski. I work for British International Investment, which is a brand new name for what used to be called CDC Group, which is basically the UK's development finance institution, our equivalent of, of DFC. Um, I think uh, what, what's probably relevant is that I've, I've been at BII for three years. And, and before that, I used to work on private sector development programs. Like I know many, many implementers are here on the line. And it was always our dream to, to kind of attract investors and, and support businesses that can attract investment. And then I moved to, to work for a development finance institution. And I realized that DFIs need a lot of heavy lifting to get some, some impactful deals over the line. To, to understand certain markets. So there's a lot of kind of legwork that needs to be done. But the two worlds, even though they are trying to achieve similar objectives, they're just worlds apart. And, and to be honest, the, the gap is narrowing, but you know, it's still, it seems quite counterproductive that we're both worlds are trying to achieve the same things, but are struggling and could use with, with the help of one another. So that's really the genesis of why we as, as BII decided to to commission this, this report together with Gatsby Africa. And worth mentioning, FMO and, and uh, the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development have, have supported us through this journey. But we wanted to really shake the tree and, and look for examples of when that collaboration has worked. And, and to be honest, there were really few examples that we could easily find. And, and then we really wanted to understand the, the reasons for, for kind of collaboration working and collaboration not working. And, and those are the things that we are un unveiled in, uh, with this study. And uh, Irene and, and Justin will take us through, through the, 
uh, the findings, but we really want to, to kind of spark a conversation between the two worlds and, and kind of be o open and honest about how we can come together. Maybe we can't come together close and maybe, you know, we, we just have to live uh, alongside each other, but maybe there are ways to kind of practically narrow the gap. So, so those are the things we wanted to talk to you about today. And also feel free to kind of ask open and honest questions and, and you know, with, with the spirit of, of kind of uh, trying to, to close the, the bridge between the two worlds. So I'll, I'll hand over to, to Justin now and, and thanks everyone for joining. Great, thank you, Alex. Hi, everybody. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, so we, we've had a, a round of introductions already, but just to just to briefly um, reintroduce ourselves. Um, uh, I'm Justin Van Rijn. I'm an independent uh, consultant with a background in, in market systems development work. Um, and personally, very excited by this topic um, on past projects. The world of investment was, was often a bit of a black box to us. Um, we knew it could be helpful, but we didn't always know how to access it. Um, so really looking forward to sharing some ideas for uh, anybody else on the line who, who might be in the same sort of position. Um, maybe if you want to quickly introduce yourself, Irene, and then we can get into it. Sure. Thanks, Justin. Um, and I come from a world that in some ways has been uh, working quite separately from the, the private sector development world, I mostly come from uh, an investment perspective. So working with DFIs uh, down to impact investors to more commercial private equity firms and uh, seeing their frustrations as well, wanting to engage uh, with private sector development programs, but not finding the, the right opportunities to do so. So as Justin said, excited as, as we've come together to co-author the study, excited to see how we can bring uh, the institutions that we're most familiar with together as well. Great, thank you, Irene. If we go to the next slide, um, which should hopefully be a poll, technology uh, permitting. Um, so we'll start off uh, with a quick one to see who we have in the audience today. Uh, and the question is, what types of work are you currently involved in? Um, so you'll see a pop up. Um, and if you could check all, all the boxes that apply to you, we'll, we'll see we have, who we have in the room. Um, give it a, give it a minute. Um, whoever, whoever's controlling this one, once you feel like we have, uh, yeah, I think that that's probably fine. 75%. Right. Okay. Um, Interesting. Um, it looks like we have a fair few uh, donors and, and implementers on the on the line. Um, some consultants. Um, quite a lot of programs with investor engagement. That's interesting. Um, all right. I hope everybody could see that. Um, let's let's move forward to the next slide, please. All right, so over the next hopefully 15 minutes or so, um, Irene and I are going to introduce the study, uh, talk through the findings and, and recommendations, um, and towards the end we'll run another poll um, to see which findings uh, resonated most strongly with you. Um, and in terms of next steps, we are actively looking for partners to help take forward um, pilot work. If anything speaks to you today, sparks ideas, um, do let us know, um, and we, we'd love to continue the, the conversation. Next slide. Uh, and again, please. Thank you. All right. The introduction um, to the to the study. Uh, the starting point, um, as as Lawrence touched on earlier, is that the worlds of development finance and private sector development often share similar high level goals. Uh, for example, around sustainable growth, around poverty reduction. Um, and over time, um, there's arguably been a, a drift towards making. Um, uh, towards more transformational approaches to achieving these goals. So PSD donors have been working in this way for some time. Um, systems thinking is now a core part of many donor strategies, but there's also been increasing interest among some DFIs um, in looking beyond the transaction to support sector-wide change. And the evidence shows that different complementary factors have to come together 
to, to drive transformational change. So conducive policies, uh, markets, finance, and, and so on. And in theory, um, this should mean a natural fit between the two sides. So PSD can benefit from large scale investment into, into their target sectors, um, BFIs uh, and other investors benefiting um, as markets are developed and, and new investment opportunities are unlocked by, by PSD. Um, but in practice, this type of alignment didn't seem to be happening very much. Um, so the, the aims of the study were to explore and, and then try to codify uh, the drivers and barriers to alignment uh, using a variety of, of different case examples, um, and then to make practical recommendations um, to actors on, on both sides who might be interested in, in closer alignment. Um, we won't go into methodology too much, but just wanted to say a, a big thank you to everybody who participated either um, via an interview or, or via the, the server that went out, and I think a, a, a good few people on the call um, might have participated, so, so thank you. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. We'll start with a few definitions um, before we get into the findings to make sure everybody's on the, on the same page. Um, so in defining what we mean by PSD, uh, the starting point was really um, programs that, that look to address system level constraints to inclusive growth um, and a variety of models and names. So market shaping, market systems, uh, upstream ecosystem building, uh, et cetera. Uh, and judging by the, the, the poll just now, probably quite a, a familiar concept to, to people on the line. Uh, but for anybody who isn't familiar, the, the idea is um, with, with, with this type of approach that, that um, projects are thinking systemically about development challenges. They're trying to get to the root causes um, and not just the symptoms of underperformance. Um, they're recognizing the importance of context and local ownership, and they're, they're working in an iterative way to, to navigate complexity. Uh, and the theory goes that if these ingredients come together, then the chances of sustainable impact at scale are increased. Um, and it's now a, a pretty mainstream approach um, amongst most donors, and we're even seeing new generations of programming coming through, uh, applying these principles to new areas, um, for example, economic transformation. Um, and it's also gaining traction amongst BFIs and some investors. So um, an example right in front of us, um, BII a few years ago set up BII Plus uh, as a unit with a, with a market shaping mandate. Um, so, so that I'll, I'll leave it there for now um, and, and pass it over to Ari. Uh, thanks, Justin. And just as we've defined uh, what PSD means on the next slide, we also look into defining what we mean when we say investment. So one of the feedbacks we heard from many of the donors and implementers we spoke to is that sometimes the, the world of investors can be a, a bit of a black box and there was a, a lack of awareness um, in many cases, perhaps not as much with with US aid implementers um, and, and program leads who, who work on many programs with an investment engagement focus, uh, but generally a lack of awareness of the investment process. So here we, we try to very quickly align on what we mean when we say development finance, what types of investors are included, as well as what we mean when we say uh, a transaction or, or an investment process so that everyone tries to speak the same language for the duration of this study at least. So in terms of investment types, um, as mentioned earlier, DFIs are, are when we looked at impact investors who are often funded by DFIs or other concessional capital sources and tend to focus on both impact and investment returns and should theoretically have the ability to invest uh, at missing middle or ticket sizes. Um, not as much of a focus, but we also briefly looked at the investment arms of foundations and other donor programs that are making the really high risk early stage investments. So, I think in discussions prior to the event, Lawrence raised a good point that many of these PSD programs can also engage uh, commercial investors or one of the uh, either it's venture early stage venture capital or larger scale private equity firms to, to provide growth or scaling capital. And we didn't focus as much on more commercial investors in the study because we felt one that the barriers to collaborating with commercial investors were, were even higher. Uh, due to constraints around return expectations, ticket sizes, et cetera. And two, that there was more of a natural uh, rationale for collaboration between investors that had a development impact focus and PSD programs. So then looking at the, the remainder of the page on the investment process, I won't spend too much time uh, here, but um, this is a simple summary of, of the four steps, four major steps of the investment process, which starts with origination when investors and companies are searching each other out. So investors looking for good opportunities to invest and companies looking for the right fit in terms of investors that can help them meet their growth goals. 
then moves on to, to due diligence. Uh, if investors and companies feel there is an opportunity, then there's a, a pretty in-depth and intensive period where the investor tries to answer all of their questions about the company to figure out if, uh, if this is a good investment for them um, in terms of getting their money back at some point. And then the, the next step would be structuring a negotiation. If all goes well with due diligence, uh, this is where investors and companies negotiate on the terms of the investment. And last but certainly not least, there's post-investment value creation, where investors and, and companies after an investment has been made work together to try to grow the, the company and for the investor and the company to see uh, benefits of, of the investment that's been made. So on the next slide, we then look at how uh, we think PSD and investment can come together, what we call alignment. So in the boxes on either side, you see different things that we hypothesized PSD programs bring to the table that might be beneficial to invest investors. And on the other side, what investors can bring to the table that might be uh, beneficial to private sector development objectives. And in the middle, um, how we see these, these things coming together could be that through, through either firm level technical assistance, um, capacity building, or uh, focus on developing a whole value chain, uh, or working on enabling environment, PSD programs uh, could create underlying conditions for, for more investment, uh, or investors could provide the types of growth capital required um, to actually meet uh, PSD objectives. Uh, and um, both sides could come together in providing specific technical assistance uh, that, are, that is aimed at a specific transaction, or more generally could just uh, be some matchmaking going on between PSD programs providing opportunities or names of uh, specific investment opportunities to investors. And at the top of that element box, how we've defined success overall is pretty simple, just PSD and investors coming together to close more investment transactions or at least two sides trying to work effectively towards this goal. So that's the definitions out of the way. If we move on to the next slide, uh, then we go come to what I think is the exciting part, which is our findings and recommendations. So some, some general observations before we dig into the, the specifics. Um, as, as Alex alluded to, we came into the study with a pretty big hypothesis that PSD and development finance should be aligning more often. That, that is a gap that is worth bridging. Um, and we we're pleased to say that in all of our, our research, it appears that everyone from both sides uh, tends to be very interested in closer alignment. Um, that was not a given when we started the, the study. So I think that's a resounding um, affirmation of the rationale for the study and, um, and where we're pushing for practical recommendations to be implemented on, on both sides. So you can see some quotes there. I won't, I won't read them out, but basically um, from, from their, in their own words, from both investors and PSC, the reasons that they see uh, collaboration between the two as, as being beneficial. Um, some other general observations um, I think that have been mentioned before is, is one, we found that oftentimes there wasn't very much awareness of what the other side did. So investors being really unaware of what, of what PSC programs did or what the benefits could be to them of collaboration and PSD programs being unaware of how investors operate and, and really not understanding why investors were not able to make more investments into the types of sectors or companies supported by PSD programs. And I think partially due to some of this lack of awareness, there wasn't very many examples of, um, of successful collaboration between PSD and an investment. So I think uh, coming out of that, given that there's really broad support for closer alignment, but few successful examples to date, we're excited to, to share the practical recommendations we have to try to increase that alignment between PSD and investors. So on the next slide, we look at a quick overview. Uh, I know there's a lot going on here, so I'll try to provide a, a concise of a summary as possible. So we started when we're looking at the barriers um, and success factors, as well as then leading into the recommendations um, for closer alignment, we started looking at what models of alignment currently exist. So that's the three that you see across the top. Uh, we looked at three models, um, an in-house offer where there are both PSC and investment capabilities in-house, structured coordination um, where there's a development finance and private sector development that's structured, both sides are structured into program design, 
And then lastly, we looked at ad hoc engagement, which is more opportunistic collaboration between DFIs and investors. And I would say some USA programs would, would fall between structured coordination and ad hoc engagement. Um, USAID Invest, for example, some of the Prosper Africa initiatives, those are very much focused uh, on generating investor engagement with private sector development initiatives. So we then found three broad themes of uh, success factors and, and challenges driving uh, alignment or the lack thereof. And um, again, we'll, we'll go into these in a little bit more detail uh, on the following pages, but the three buckets um, of success factors and challenges we found start with um, a misalignment in strategy and incentives, then continue to um, lack of complementary cap capacities or the ability to, to coordinate with the other side, and then continue on to operational um, models and tools that are also very different between PSD and investment. And for each theme uh, or bucket of success factor and, and challenges, we then came up with what we feel like are practical, practical and actionable recommendations to address each of these um, themes of challenges. Um, one is, is trying to align strategies and incentives around common opportunities between TSC and investment. Two is to try to build or to hire crossover knowledge between TSC and investment and to actually invest in coordination infrastructure. And the third theme in our recommendations is to try to close the gap between product offers. And what we mean by product offers is what each side can, can offer the other in terms of uh, benefits to collaboration. So on the next page, we dive into the first theme. Oh, I skipped ahead of myself. On the next page, we actually try to define better what um, the current models of uh, alignment are, but I think we can just um, skip past this since we, we spent a little bit of time explaining that on the previous slide. So let's jump into how we can drive more alignment and what our actual recommendations are. So around theme one, which is aligning strategies and incentives around common opportunities, um, we first looked at it across the top of the, the page, you'll see a summary of our findings around the current barriers to alignment that are related to mismatched strategies and incentives. So one, there are different views on the role of the firm between uh, donors and PSD implementers versus investors. So donors are interested in um, starting races, so enabling the growth of an entire sector or a new value chain, uh, and there are limitations uh, to how much donors can, can pick winners or put a finger on a scale and use donor capital to support the success of individual firms. But for investors, that's the whole point. The success of ind individual firms are how investors are, are set up to, to operate um, because that's where the investment returns come from. So there's that divergence around how much to focus on the success of an individual firm versus enabling the growth of an entire sector or value chain. Then there's uh, also a mismatch around how to select common sectors and opportunities. So many PSD programs we spoke to pick the sectors where the interventions are focused based on which will have the most amount of impact on the poorest of the poor or on marginalized communities. Whereas then investors focus on the types of sectors and firms that will actually be commercially sustainable in the long term. And this is this is changing as, as you know, both investors and PSD programs think from, from the other perspective, but this has still led to a, a lot of mismatch in terms of you know, PSD programs presenting opportunities to investors and investors going, well, we can't invest in these because we don't think the sector is ever going to be competitive in this country or in this region. And then the, the third challenge here is divergent timelines between investors who generally have to, unless you're a, a, a big GFI or a permanent capital vehicle, at some point return funds to their own investors uh, with ideally an investment return. So investment funds have timeframes of seven, 10, in the very long term, 15 years. Whereas, um, you know, market system thinking thinks about change and, and sector transformation in terms of the, the, the very long decades, um, long time horizons. So there's also a challenge here of, of PSD implementation cycles being much shorter than that and causing some, some lost momentum in engaging with investors. Then the last, um, the last challenge here is mismatched incentives for alignment on both sides. So some programs, PSD programs, uh, don't have an investor engagement component. And, and so the implementers um, aren't really incentivized to try to then um, obviously reach out to investors. Uh, so then some of the recommendations we came up with um, for addressing these, you can see below. So 
Um, one, which we also feel is a quick win, easily implementable by, by PSD donors and implementers, is to actually develop sector and opportunity selection criteria that are based both on impact and commercial viability so that it meets PSD objectives, um, as well as investors' uh, commercial return uh, objectives. Then the second recommendation here is to engage the other side in setting the investment strategies and program design um, from, a, from a beginning standpoint so that the two sides start out uh, aligned at a high level. Then to increase focus on investment in PSD results frameworks without creating perverse incentives, increase emphasis on the other side on market shaping as part of the investment process, and then to build an exit strategy into PSD program design to actually maintain strategic alignment um, handing over, for instance, investment-related activities between program cycles. Um, so I'll hand it over to, to Justin to finish walking through the specific findings. Thanks, Irene. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, Eve 2 is all around building uh, up the, the knowledge of the other side and, and the mechanics of coordination. Um, so we'll start with, with some of the barriers. One was mixed mutual perceptions and limited awareness. So some investors had not yet seen a, a clear value proposition from, from PSD. And PSD sometimes thought that investors should be willing to take more risks. Um, in some cases, that was based on, on pretty limited real world interaction, but it doesn't really matter, you know, based on experience or not, negative perceptions sometimes shut down opportunities before they, before they ever get off the ground. Um, the, the next point there, um, gaps in crossover knowledge. Um, so, so in general, quite limited awareness uh, of the investment process in the, in the PSD world. Uh, and without speaking the language of investment, um, it can be pretty difficult to engage with investors in a, in a compelling way. Um, we, 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 heard, we heard examples of, of some projects sort of priming the pump for the, for the wrong opportunities, things that um, things just would never attract it in investment. Um, on the other side, investors also still get into grips with what PSD projects actually do uh, and how a market shaping approach works. So a, a bit of a lingering view that, that um, systems change work is sort of up in the clouds and a little bit removed from, from the day-to-day -day realities of investment. Um, the next one was um, mixed understanding on the PSD side around the, the sort of specialist expertise that is needed to source structure and, and close a deal so that the sort of process that Irene took us through earlier. Um, and USA Investors it was a really good example of a, of a project um, supporting um, investment facilitation um, services pretty extensively and I hope we can hear from, from somebody on that team a, a little later on. Um, lastly, the, the research identified very few initiatives set up to directly support alignment. Um, uh, some of the respondents noted that the type of coordination was, was sort of under-resourced, and under, under-prioritized. Um, and without dedicated functions, uh, coordination functions, what has ended up happening is that a lot of activity is driven, driven by uh, informal networks, um, which can be really powerful and, and often how deals get done. But it might also mean that capital and TA um, get up, end up getting getting channeled um, into the same groups again and again. Often, international founders and management teams potentially missing really good opportunities out, outside these established networks. Um, so, in terms of recommendations, one is to, to pool resources to map whole economic development ecosystems at country or sector levels um, to to just raise awareness of opportunities um, for, for alignment. Um, so that's moving beyond a, a piecemeal sort of project by project approach, which we can miss the whole picture. Um, secondly, uh, invest in, in PSD, uh, investor coordination at the country level and, and try and target this. So the, the FCDO Manufacturing Africa project was doing some interesting um, experimenting around uh, coordination based on specific investment opportunities rather than a sort of general talk shop. Um, the next one is pooling DFI technical assistance around joined up initiatives. Um, so for a variety of reasons, a single DFI might, might struggle uh, to deploy uh, market shaping TA alone, but might have scope to do so as, as part of a consortium. Um, so the, the Invest for Impact Nepal um, uh, platform is a, is a good example of this in action um, with BII, FMO, and then development partner SDC joining forces. Um, and I hope Alex can tell us a little bit more about that later on. Um, the next one is piloting cross-functional secondments. So for example, from a, somebody from a, a DFI deal team uh, going and sitting in a PSD program uh, or vice versa. Um, the next one was, was running practical training on, on crossover skills. So uh, like an investment 101 or mini CFA for, for PSD teams, uh, program teams, implementer teams, donor teams, and then equally uh, market shaping in practice for, for investors. Um, and the last, the last recommendation from, from this section 
um, just recognize that, that the role that specialist investment advisors can and sh probably should play in, in this process um, in, in sort of tuning market shaping work in a way that resonates with investors and, and building space for these resources in, in program budgets. We, we shouldn't take for granted that that happens automatically. If we move on to the, the next slide, um, which is the, the third and sort of final set of, of findings and, and recommendations. Um, and it looks at the tactical side of aligning these offers. So in terms of the, the current barriers, some investors spoke about the hurdles of engaging with, with PSD. So perceptions of, of sort of strings attached to partnership, complicated applications and reporting, uh, and then sometimes a bit of a, bit of a prescriptive approach to, to how TA might, might be used, um, which was not always aligned with, with current needs. Um, secondly, uh, investor fund structures can sometimes uh, limit ticket sizes and risk appetite. Um, so, so I think we, we, we all know that sometimes the advice face constraints around making these riskier, smaller direct investments into, into nascent markets, um, which are often exactly the areas PSD initiatives are focusing. Um, and it means that there's, there's often not a particularly clear path uh, from PSD program support through to the DFI scale investment. Um, and then indirect DFI investment, so, so through funds, um, can often work with smaller ticket sizes, but in practice, the risk return expectations and the management fee structures can, can actually disincentivize this. Um, the, the last finding here was that uh, the, 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 the toolbox for collaboration probably needs a, a little bit more attention. Um, so um, for PSD projects, direct financial support is sometimes viewed as a, as a tool of last resort, um, either for, for contractual or, or for strategic reasons. Um, and where direct finance is used, it's, it's often focused on reaching proof of concept for an innovation um, rather than getting that innovation to scale. So, for example, by joining up with, with external investment. Um, and when it came to one of the core PSD tools, technical assistance, um, investors did, did, did acknowledge that high quality specialist TA was, was extremely valuable, but that their experiences with TA had been hit and miss in terms of quality and, and relevance. So, um, four recommendations in, in this theme. Um, so one is building up the commercial relevance of the, the PSD offer um, by, by developing products that, that um, can deliver more direct value to, to investors and their investees. Um, so a couple of examples, one might be building the business case for investment into particular sectors, for example, through supporting feasibility work. Um, and the FCDO SUED project in Kenya was, was doing some really interesting work um, on, on this. Um, and then the, the other one is just making sure that when TA is deployed, it's actually high quality and really well targeted at, at, at the needs of, of firms and, and, and their investors. Um, so Gatsby Africa has some good examples of, of doing this well in sectors like forestry and uh, aquaculture and tea, uh, where they're bringing in sort of world-class advisors um, that, that really uh, walk that line between technical and, and commercial knowledge. Um, the next one is experimenting with direct funding, uh, direct financing as part of PSD work. Um, so obviously a, a big spectrum here in terms of whether and how PSD projects use direct finance, um, but probably scope to build a, a continue building a, a sort of more nuanced and pragmatic view of delivering financial support alongside uh, market shaping work to incentivize investor engagement. Um, and it's also a mistake to think that every PSD project um, knows about every financial tool. Um, so building understanding of things like blended finance of credit guarantees can, can help teams make informed decisions about what they want to include in, in their toolkits. Um, uh, second to last one here is, is realigning systems change terminology. Um, so many of us take this for granted and sort of speak a bit of a, 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 our own language on, on this, um, but it can be really confusing for investor audiences. And, and Irene and I found this firsthand in, in a few situations um, during, during the research phase. So it's really important to communicate the real world value that um, market shaping approaches can offer. Uh, and then lastly, um, supporting um, first time fund managers and experimenting with, with new fund models. So for example, running research on, uh, on costs and, and compensation for, for different types of fund models, and then potentially even piloting models with, with, um, with sort of different investment processes and management fee and, and carried interest structures. Um, so that's taken you through the, the findings. Um, we, can, we can go to poll two. I, I don't know if the, the team controlling the presentation uh, wants to run this or, or whether, we, whether we speed through it. Uh, 
Okay, I think let, let's run it. Okay, so um, pe test, testing whether, whether that resonated. Um, we, we've sort of summarized the, the recommendations here. Um, could the audience have a look and, and choose three that, that resonate most strongly with you? Fully acknowledge um, it's a, it's a lot to take in, but um, interested to, to see what what's what's uh, what's come across most. All right. Great. Um, okay, let's see what we've got. Okay, interesting. I think we, we've got a, we've got a lot to digest here, but the ones that, that jump out to me, aligning the opportunity and sector selection criteria, um, engagement with the other side of the design stage, coordination at country level. Great, okay. Um, let's go to the next slide, please. And again. Great, okay. So that was quite a lot to take in in a, in a short space of time. Um, hopefully you've seen the, the link to the, the report in the, in the chat box and can see that at your leisure. Um, I think I'd like to reiterate what we saw throughout the study um, despite all these all these barriers and all these challenges, was a lot of interest. There's, there's latent demand for this for sure, um, and I think everybody's sort of scratching their heads on on how to make it happen. Um, most of us think that that more alignment under the right conditions is, is definitely worth worth pursuing. Um, the study itself, just a starting point, and the next step is to start pilot testing some new approaches. Um, so to make that happen, we're we're looking for partners to, to help to help us take this forward. Um, you know, you might have a, a program portfolio you're, you're willing to, to sort of, um, I, I saw somebody else to, to take a look at, you know, there might be, might be opportunities to implement things, fund things, etc. So please get a, a, in touch with a member of the team if, you, if you're interested to participate in, in any way. Um, that's it from, from Irene and myself. Um, we'll, we'll hand it back um, and look forward to uh, the discussion. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Justin and Irene. You've got a lot, uh, a lot to think about. Uh, great study, and thank you very much. Um, uh, as I'm sure you all know, uh, the U.S. government uh, now it has a development uh, uh, finance institution, the Develop uh, Development Finance Corporation, and they have been wrestling with these issues as well. We're lucky to have uh, Raul Flores, who is a managing director in the uh, PSC hub within USAID and manages the DFC USAID relationship. I wanted to turn it over to uh, Raul. Yeah, thanks, Lawrence. Um, happy to be here and hello, everyone. Um, a lot of this resonates with me, um, probably pretty personally, because I, I was hired to try to find this alignment between USAID as our donor institution and DFC as the development finance institution of, of the US government. And I would say, you know, in everything I've heard, um, what really resonates with me is that all this should be ideal. We can make transformational change together um, more sustainable and more efficient, but there's a lot of complexity in getting to what seems like something very simple. And that's something that we've you know, lived every day in trying to stand up this bilateral partnership, at least within the US government. Um, in some ways, the DFC and USAID relationship is a little bit probably easier than, than the global challenge of this. And, and that's because DFC took on a component of USAID what is our development credit authority when, um, oh, I guess my video is off, I didn't mean to do that. Um, hold on, yeah. no one can see me. Uh, anyway, sorry about that, I'll keep on talking. Um, part of that is because of the, uh, you know, the fact that US, DFC took USAID, a part of USAID development credit authority, which was a tool we had for 20 years um, within the US, USAID. So there's personnel there who are very familiar with um, 
you know, with, with USA, our development objectives, how missions work, how we can align investments with, you know, the, the programmatic work that a mission is doing. Part of that is probably part of this is more challenging than, than that sort of larger dynamic. And, and that's because the other part of DOC and the, the larger part of DOC was, was OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which had a, you know, had been investing in, in um, overseas for, for many years, um, lending and providing political risk insurance, but without a development mandate. So sort of getting that cultural change with an institution that already partially exists has been, I think, you know, a little bit, um, you know, maybe more difficult than, um, you know, working, I guess, with a, you know, a sister DFI that has a longer history there. So, you know, some things that probably made this a little bit unique to our situation. Um, you know, and what I've learned in this really, and I think this, you know, kind of gets to what a lot of this, what we've heard today is that our agencies do work um, better and we're stronger when we're more aligned and we can create more of that transformational change that was discussed. Um, Another thing is that we have to be really intentional and diligent about this alignment. We can't just expect it to fall in place. A USA program to facilitate investment from DFC or DFC investment to create the market change and conditions that you know USAID would, would like. So we have to be really intentional on how to and do this. Uh, and and um, there are of course challenges, but you know one thing I think we hear all the challenges from our missions. We hear the challenges from our senior leadership. We hear the challenges on the DFC side. Is that we can't let sort of perfect be the enemy of, of good here. Um, you know, we, we are in a much better place because we are really trying to work and shape this um, than we would be otherwise. Um, and then, you know, the fourth thing I would say I've learned from all this is that we can be successful in this alignment, but it really takes, you know, the constant shaping and, and that intentional work and working together, um, really kind of like you know, making any partnership stronger. Um, you know, I, I just backing up for a second is, you know, I think, this audience is familiar with sort of how we got here. Um, USAID had a tool on development credit authority, worked for about you know, 20 years, um, providing partial credit guarantees to financial institutions, institutions to encourage lending into markets and sectors where USAID works. And there's large scale challenges um, to facilitate access um, you know, for many borrowers that really spurs economic growth. Um, by the time the DFC was created, we had this portfolio of over 600 guarantees uh, um, across um, 60 plus countries with over 400 um, local partners. So, you know, something that was really embedded into USAID programs and, and we saw as a, a useful and dynamic tool within USAID. So in 2018, when, when Congress authorized DFC to be launched and it, it launched in December, 2019, you know, they took that whole portfolio um, with them. So things that were already being implemented by USAID, um, but I think what that also meant for USAID is that we were losing this direct tool that we had, and which was really our only transactional development finance tool. And that got taken away from us at a time when the agency was moving more into this private sector engagement driven direction. Um, and part of that policy was you know, mobilizing investment to meet these financing gaps that exist you know, towards our development challenges globally. So you know, we were putting an emphasis on that. At the same time, we were losing this tool. So it was really imperative on us to make this alignment work so that we did not you know, full stop kind of lose access to direct transactional support that we would need a, as an agency. Um, on the other side of this, um, you know, OPIC was gaining, by becoming DFC, was gaining this development mandate that they didn't really have uh, experience with. So it was imperative on them to really kind of understand how USAID worked and, and, you know, to push them towards doing more business in lower and lower middle income countries, which was mandated, you know, by the Build Act and by law. So there's, you know, a lot of this in terms of how we work together and why we stood up this partnership was, was kind of because of that. It was really imperative on us to, to make this work. Um, without getting, I think, I don't, have, I don't have too much time. So without getting sort of on the weeds and, and everything that we do to make this work, I just a kind of a, a few quick things. One is, you know, that USA personnel that went to DFC became its own unit. And that unit still works on deals that are brought to them and, and we call them sponsored by USA missions. So missions who have a, a, a development objective that they want to achieve, whatever sector it is, um, where they'd like to crowd in investments and that's sort of their, um, you know, so that meets sort of their programmatic needs, you know, they bring in the mission transaction unit and the mission transaction units, are, you know, transacts, um, you know, something that USAID helps originate and monitors and, and, you know, 
supports with the with technical assistance or the, the impact of, of that deal. So there's a specific unit at DOC that works on that. I know this is familiar with, with some folks um, on this call. Um, second is that DFC stood up this position of the chief development officer, um, uh, kind of focused on moving DFC in this developmentally oriented way. Um, that that uh, CDO is, is a USAID detailee who's a senior foreign service officer, Andy Herskowitz, who used to run Power Africa. So, you know, he leads really that engagement with USAID leadership, um, leads briefings on pipeline and ways to align with, you know, USAID regional bureau leadership. So helps facilitate that communication and that alignment. Um, the third, we, this was to do this has been really sort of spearheaded by agency leadership. So there's been, you know, sort of a, a push down from the top and a real buy-in from the top or the administrator and the CEO of DFC meet regularly. And this sort of trickles down all the way to the working levels. But we really had that buy-in from the beginning of, of all this. Um, we've also stood up individual teams that focus on this, my team included, where, you know, my job is to try to find alignment between these two things. Um, and in part of that, we've, you know, we've heard some of this, you know, need for training programs and understanding of what each other does. So, you know, we've done a lot of that. We host webinars for USAID where DOC comes in. Um, we're looking to do that more on the other side. Um, we've created cross-agency details where foreign service officers get to spend, USA foreign service officers get to spend some time at DFC and, and sort of bring that experience and understanding of development finance to them in the field, you know, as they continue on their journey throughout USAID. Um, so, you know, for the most part, I would say this is this is working. Um, you know, the, the MTU, that unit of DOC that focuses on USA transactions, closed over 30 transactions in its first year, um, mobilizing, you know, close to $900 million in guaranteed capital, along with you know, over $100 million of loan disbursements. Um, this is certainly uh, not perfect so far in, in my two years of, of doing this. Um, a, a lot of the reasons that have already been given where our, we're separate institutions, we come from different bureaucracies, we have different incentives, um, DFC is certainly more focused on development than OPIC was, but they have their own credit risk appetite and, and multiple stakeholders to answer that view DFC's um, strengths or uh, mandates differently, whether it related to foreign policy, national security, and you know, OPIC always had that talking point where they produce a return for the U.S. To talk taxpayer, and, and you know, so there's that view of DFC as well. Um, so there may be certain priorities the USA has and wants to move in DFC in a direction. Um, but it's it's more difficult to do so than than um, you know I would I would say um, it's easier said than, easier said than done. Um, you know one thing that we talked about is promoting earlier stage investments. I think USA would like to see more of that than than DFC has taken on that risk appetite for. Um, we also have two very different strategic approaches. USA um, plans out years in advance. We do country development strategies. We identified challenges, market conditions that we want to address. Um, and are more sort of long-term and proactive on that DFC, as I think many DFIs are, are more reactionary. They receive requests for financing from a client, they assess the risk, the impact of the investment, and don't necessarily look at these investments through a lens of sort of catalyzing market development. And, and you know, that makes sense in a lot of ways because investments have timelines to meet, you know, funds have closing dates. So there's a rationale in, in those different approaches. So to close, um, just say, you know, I think there's a lot more we can do. We've had a more successful start in doing this than I think we, we originally thought when we were losing DCA, um, but it takes a lot of effort and it's something that we're constantly working on um, to improve, um, you know, sort of beyond our work with the mission transaction unit is how do we move these things closer in an organic way where we understand each other's language and we really work on creating that transformational change. Um, so I'll stop there. Um, I do have you know, plenty of case studies and examples of how this is all working you know, from the field. Um, if anyone's interested in reaching out, I'm happy to share you know, what's in that pipeline and how this has worked um, in our first couple of years of trying this. So thanks for having me and, and I'll, I'll stop there. I know we'll have some time for Q&A. Yeah, uh, thanks Raul. Um, Autumn Gorman here. I'm part of the Private Sector Engagement Hub. We had a few questions come in. And know where time is running a little short, so I'm going to try to preemptively answer a couple. Um, so uh, Tara Davis had asked a question about uh, resources to educate program practitioners on blended finance. And there are some things on market links and, and as part of our mobilizing finance for development series that I definitely recommend that you check out. There's certainly some resources on convergence and other um, publicly available resources. Um, yeah, so let's see, I'm trying to go through. So one of, we've had some questions that are about uh, 
uh, wanting to hear from the panelists about whether there's certain types of financing or sectors or the use of funding versus co-financing that can really help in this space. Irene or Justin or Arjun? On the point around sectors, it's a, it's a really interesting one. Um, so we, we started the study with a, an intention to look at um, um, impactful sectors from, from like a job creation perspective, um, you know, sectors with, with high um, labor intensivity and um, ideally sectors that uh, were, were sort of um, move, moving towards the, the more productive end of the spectrum. Um, we, we found very few examples and sort of had to cross them a little, little bit wider. So I don't think we came out of it with, with sort of clear clear conclusions on sort of one sector being being better than the other. The, the, the two things that I would say there is, is one, it's around how sectors are selected on, on each side um, and the sort of relative weighting that, um, you know, e e each group is sort of giving, giving their sector selection process. Obviously, investors sort of thinking a lot more commercially and, and, and PSD tending to think a lot more in terms of impact and definitely it's a meet in the middle there. Um, but equally, uh, a, a theme that we identified was um, actors on both sides not not always sort of looking at the uh, the sort of host countries um, economic development planning. So, sometimes sort of running in with with preconceived ideas of the right sectors and not sort of thinking, well, actually, that this country is it does have an economic transformation plan and it is targeting sectors, and we do need to take that seriously. So, quite interesting, you know what. What is the basis for shooting sectors? Um, the second thing I'd say is that I think I think that the Gatsby team in, in East Africa um, have have sort of walked a, a, a pretty smart line in terms of the, the types of sectors that they've chosen. Um, so I think there are some interesting case examples there. In case um, Arjun or I think we've got James and, and Ben on the line as well. In case anybody wants to, to comment around the, the Gatsby sort of sector selection uh, process. Um, I, I think I'll just add one more one more point there. I think in addition to looking at the country context and aligning with national economic development priorities, as well as looking at impact uh, considerations like job creation inclusiveness, I think investors are very interested in does the sector have a chance of being competitive or growing in a country. So for instance, um, you know, maybe you want to invest in the furniture sector. Sounds great. You can employ a lot of laborers, but you're in the desert of South Sudan. There's not a lot of wood available. So you know, you can't competitively manufacture that furniture, there's no market for it. So that's the way that that investors tend to think. And I think from the from the other side, there's often been been a little mismatch in, in how sectors are chosen as, as Justin was um, just describing. Great, uh, thank you. That was really um, helpful. And the panelists have offered, I think some have some meetings immediately after this webinar, but so they've offered to respond to additional questions via emails. Maybe we can share them in the post event resources um, shared. But um, if we could perhaps get one more quick in, there was certainly a couple of questions and I had one myself about the ticket size challenge, right? A lot of private sector development programs are really trying to help build small, medium enterprises, support startups, but the DFIs have a higher transaction size window. And you know, because of the same reasons that we talk about mobilizing finance for development, the transaction costs, et cetera, risks. So how can we um, navigate that a little bit more? What are your recommendations there? Yeah, I don't think it's realistic to say, you know, DFIs who are used to doing deals in the tens of millions of dollars or on the small side, $5 million, suddenly transition to doing deals that are, you know, and that making investments that are $50,000, $100,000, which are sometimes the types of investments that are most needed for these early stage SMEs. So I think the solution in one of our recommendations has to be, let's experiment with different types of fund models. Uh, I think many impact investors have migrated wholesale, a Silicon Valley venture capital model into impact investing. So very tight budgets for transactions, very high return expectations, which again, doesn't work in the types of emerging markets at the types of high risk, small ticket size, early stage deals that need to be done in many of these markets to support um, the growth of these, these innovative but very nascent sectors. So I think we need to experiment with different types of fund models and DFIs can fund those fund models or those different investment models. And that's a way that they can indirectly then support these types of small ticket size, early stage risky investments. Wonderful. Um, thanks, Irene. Um, that is certainly um, an area of interest for I think both DFIs and um, uh, donor agencies. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. We're at time. I uh, 
want to thank everyone for joining us and hopefully you can stay tuned for additional resources and um, you know how to reach us if you have any additional questions or care to follow up and thanks again for your time. It's great to see everyone here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our moderators. And thanks to all attended today's session. Again, as you're exiting today's session, please do feel free to enter in any remaining comments or questions that you have in the chat. We will do our best to address these and um, the recording, the presentation, and some post-event resources will all be posted on the Market Links website. So again, we want to thank all of you for joining us today and hope you have a great rest of the day.